It is a joy to be with you, and um, <clears throat> I realize that it seems that our, our world is getting much less safe, more perilous all the time with respect to this virus, yet I am trusting God to protect his people. I realize that um, there is a, 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 an overwhelming fear in the lives of many around us, and I, I think that we ought to be different, not less cautious, but much less fearful. Because number one, our God is our protector. Number two, we have to be ministering to people who are in fear. And we can't minister to them if we're in fear. So we've got to be confident in our God to protect us as we minister to people now. In these days, it's tough to do that, except virtually. Or six feet away with a mask on and most folk don't even want to be around folk like that now. And so I'm, I'm begging for you to figure out some really creative ways during this holiday season to touch people who are insecure. To go beyond your own concerns and figure out a way to send them gifts through Amazon or eBay or whoever your virtual store is. Send them cards. Figure out a way to touch them because in this it, it, Christmas, this, the holiday season, is when depression is at its highest during the year because some people are just lonely. They don't get to experience everything that others do. They don't have friends. They don't have family. And now they're isolated. Even if they wanted to be with people, they can't. And so it's kind of, it's kind of exacerbated. You've got an amplified sense of insecurity and loneliness. This is a wonderful moment for the church to reach out and be what it should be to those who can't figure out what to do or how to be. So I'm begging you, go beyond your own insecurities and your own concerns about your life and find a creative way in God to touch somebody else. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Ours was wonderful and intimate. Uh, <clears throat> in the last four days, I've gained five pounds, and I'm happy about it. I'm not mad. I'll lose it next week, but I'm real happy. My wife cooked. It was wonderful. Uh, we had all kinds of desserts that are still left over, and I'm enjoying every one of them every day. It's one moment along with Christmas where I just indulge and just don't care, though I do use my treadmill a whole lot more. Um, as we enter into the holiday season, uh, I want you to, to accentuate your worship and to make sure that Jesus is the center of your moments. Uh, figure out some ways to make worship very real in your house with devotions. Uh, read your Bible stories about the Christmas story if you can. Figure out a way to help your children understand it better than just uh, somebody coming down a chimney. Um, help them to understand the real purpose of the season. We're going to finish our series today on the Beatitudes. I'm going to weave in a little bit of the Christmas story that's uh, maybe with a different emphasis than what you're normally hearing. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to live in America and understand what persecution is. Turn with me over to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 10 and 11. We're finishing the series on the Beatitudes. The title of the message is Fortunate Fugitives. Fortunate fugitives. Matthew 5, 10, and 11. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 11. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Lord, help us as we study your word. Two things I'd like to talk to you about today. You're fortunate when you are treated maleficently. And you are fortunate when you are creatively and continually treated maleficently. Blessing in Jesus' definition is very different than what people would have defined it in his day as he was teaching the disciples. Blessing to them was all about natural circumstances, the sense of lack of want and lack of difficulty. Blessing was evidenced <clears throat> by somebody who had a lot of material possessions, 
That's why the disciples couldn't figure out how in the world Jesus could call the rich young ruler who came to him somebody who could be on the other side of blessing when he was coming to him trying to figure out the right thing to do and Jesus said what you need to do is sell all your possessions and give them to the poor and, and, and the rich young ruler went away sad because he was very wealthy and Jesus said you know it's really hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God and the disciples said well, well who can not get in their idea was that if you were blessed materially surely you had to be blessed spiritually because the only way you got the material blessing is if God gave it to you well, simply because God gives you stuff. And indeed, anybody who is blessed with anything, material or that which is uh, endemic to all of humanity, like breathing, is definitely that which comes from God because he is the sustainer and the distributor of all things. But simply because he does it doesn't mean he, he's happy with you. It means he might be just merciful. There's a lot of... My children have always been wonderfully obedient. But on the occasion when they weren't, I didn't withhold food from them. I didn't say, give me all those clothes in your closet back. I still cared about them and loved them. And I gave them stuff, not because they necessarily deserved it, but because they had my last name. God cares about humanity. And so he blesses humanity not on the basis of whether they deserve it, but because he cares so simply because somebody has material possessions should not be a qualification on whether he is pleased with their conduct. But the disciples couldn't understand that because they thought all material possession came from God and if God gave it to them, surely God must be happy with them. No, God just loves them. Blessing is not that which needs to be defined by the stuff in the world. As I said in my last sermon, there is nobody on the planet who is more blessed than me. But there are a whole bunch of people who have more stuff than me. I've got a great wife. After 33 years, 34 in two weeks, she still loves me. And she knows me better than anybody else and she loves me. That's a, that's a blessing. I have wonderful children who respect me. I've got great friends that still want to be with me. Some of them longer than I've been married. I have a wonderful church. I've got my health. I'm not on any prescription medication. I'm in good shape. I'm fit. I'm not ascribing that to whether it be a good diet or exercise. I'm saying the grace of God has enabled me to live long and strong with health. I have so many things for which I need to be grateful, not the least of which is I have a relationship with my God who has saved me and loved me and given me a reservation in glory and continually endures with me and cares for me and is patient with me and empowers me and, and, and sometimes acts like he really likes me in front of you by anointing me with stuff that you want to hear and helps you when you walk out the door. Nobody on the planet is more blessed than me. Nobody. Nobody. But it has nothing to do with how much or how little I have materially. It has everything to do with my relationship with God Almighty. So whether I'm doing well or whether I'm doing bad, I'm still blessed. Whether I'm worn out because the world has just beat the heck out of me. Whether it be through persecution, whether it be through insults, whether it be through, through just, just trying to push things and feeling to push back. Whatever it might be, just worn out. I'm blessed. Because blessed are you who are poor spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. The word spirit is, in the Greek there is the word pneuma. And the word uh, poor is lack. Blessed are you who lack breath, for yours is the kingdom of God. I can't tell you how many times I wake up in the morning tired, feeling like, oh, another 24. Jesus, help me. Help me. I'm, I'm lacking breath today. I don't know any of y'all ever run track. There, there's, a, there's a demonic race in track. There are a couple of them, but one's, one's particularly demonic. It's the, the 400 meters. <laughs> Most of you all, if you worked hard, even though it wouldn't be fast, you could run 100 meters and not die. You, most of you all, if you ever run 400, we'd have to call EMT. 911 would be on the way. It is terrible. If you run it well, it is terrible. You feel like you're going to die at the end of it. That's if you run it right. And there's oxygen every place, but you can't find it. 
The 400 meters is a terrible... That's the way I feel sometimes. Having run a 400 meters in life and just... I don't have anything else left, God. I laid it all on the field. I got nothing left. But, but God kind of likes it when we come to the end of ourselves because it's usually the awesome beginning of him. When you've wasted all the strength you got, now you get to tap into his. Blessed are you who lack breath for yours is the kingdom. I got a stash for you. I'm blessed even when I don't feel it. Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted. <laughs> for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. We Americans, we don't, under, we, we don't get to experience a whole lot of persecution. We experience a lot of inconvenience. There's a buzz around legal circles it's that for some reason the government might take away congregations 501c3 status which is their not-for-profit status if they don't comply with certain government regulations and pastors are crying out and saying this is persecution eh, I don't know inconvenient most countries don't even have the status we have. The Philippines, one of my best friends, Pastor Steve Merle, starter, it founded a church that now is 94,000 members in Manila. 94,000 members. And that's not on Easter. 94,000. He says, we don't have a 501c3. Our people still tithe. They don't get any tax benefit for that. Eh, it's inconvenience that they take it away. Persecution is the direct onslaught of the enemy by somebody or himself personally against the progress of the gospel message, not against your tax deduction. Now, I want it. It wouldn't be pleasant, but I don't know that I would define it as persecution. Because we've experienced so much freedom in America, every little thing, we want to slot in the spot of feeling like, oh, the, the, the world is against us. Everything is going, and we need to, to back up and, 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 and entrench ourselves in our American liberty because this is a fight we need to win. Okay, I'm not mad about anybody who wants to stick up for the Constitution. I think that's good. I just don't want to define it as persecution. Lest we cry wolf when there is none. Persecution is that which my friends in China are experiencing in our underground church there. They can't preach the gospel in the street. If not, they are jailed. They're in danger of losing their home. The government will come and confiscate their home, making their entire family homeless. They've got to meet behind closed doors and underground. They tap their phones to find out if there's some kind of communication that they can center on and see where they're secretly meeting. That's persecution. We don't have that. Now, I'm not saying we won't get there. And America, sadly, does have some history of persecuting the church. It's hard to find. Because our nation was pretty much established on many of the principles that are gospel-oriented and kingdom-founded, those which are in the Bible. Most of the founding fathers <clears throat> would consider themselves Christians, and those who were not were deists. They believed in a God, but they just didn't believe he had any function in the world, that he kind of slung it into existence and said, figure yourself out. They all had some concept of who God was, at least, let's say, 95% of them. And so the foundational principles upon which this nation was established were on biblical principles. They missed it in a couple of areas. And the one upon which they missed it most was the one of slavery. And it's interesting. <clears throat> the Civil War wasn't fought over slavery, but it was fought around slavery. It was fought over the state's rights, but it was the state's rights <laughs> to own slaves. 
And so it wasn't slavery, it was states' rights, but it was all about slavery. And, and just before the Civil War, about 30 years before, um, there, there was a movement called the Abolitionist Movement. And it doesn't get enough credibility as being Christian in its orientation. It was more sociological in its orientation. It was protestation in its orientation. But the abolitionist movement was really uh, begun in England with William Wilberforce, who was a firebrand against this thing called slavery. And, and he saw it eradicated, but he died just before he saw it. So I'll say that differently. It was eradicated as a result of his efforts, but he died like nine months before. It was actually eradicated in the entire British Empire. But that was about 1830s, 1820s, which started something in America. And this abolitionist movement began to take, take, take some root, get some momentum. And it was all, for the most part, led by Christians who said, these people who are wonderful and made in the image of God need to be free. And they laid down their lives for the benefit of folks they didn't even know. But these people that for, for whom they laid down their lives had no voice, had no rights, had no ability to fight for themselves. If they, if they ever resisted, they would be beaten and legally killed. And so the abolitionists fought. And let me read you a quote from Christianity Today on these wonderful folks. <clears throat> it says, They were the most hated men and women in America. All across the South, rewards were posted for their lives. Southerners, or Southern postmasters, routinely collected their pamphlets from the mail and burned them. In the North, these radicals were mobbed, shouted down, beaten up. Their houses burned, and their printing presses were destroyed. For 30 years, to the very eve of the Civil War, the word abolitionist was an insult. And yet these people aren't mentioned in Fox's Book of Martyrs. They don't go down in history as people who were persecuted for righteousness' sake. And yet they were. And boy, I am so grateful for them. Because they fought for the freedom of my great, great, great grandfather. So grateful. Interesting that these people are forgotten. Because I think it could happen again as we fight for people who have no voice, those who cannot speak up for themselves. As we enter into a phase where people think we are only speaking on political terms. You know, one of the things back in this time period where, where persecution was happening with Christians was that they kept telling the pastors, stop talking about abolition because it's too political in the sermon. It's too political. I mean, we got Southerners that think it's okay. We got Northerners that think it's not good. And, and we're, we're messing up the church. Stop talking about this. Well, I'm not quite sure whether something that is wrong shouldn't be addressed, even if it has political overtones, primarily because somebody declared something wrong legal. I can't help that it might be political. I just know it's wrong. Not telling people who to vote for. Just saying, got to stop this. Got to stop this. It's wrong. Oh, and pastors were shouted down. People would leave the church, calling them all kind of names. And they said, wait, I'm just loving people according to the gospel. I'm just trying to figure out the best thing to do. I imagine now that slavery is done, we'll figure out another way to be persecuted, to speak up for those that have no voice, the unborn, for those that need our assistance that cannot get it otherwise, and be called all kinds of names. Maybe my house will be burned down. Maybe I'll be thrown in jail. I don't know. But simply because somebody declares something legal doesn't make it just political. And it doesn't mean I need to shut my mouth because it's still wrong. Persecution, persecution. And remember, Jesus did not die for his religion. They put him on the cross because they said he was a rival king. The saints were not persecuted after him. 
and thrown to the lions because of their religion. They were persecuted because they worshipped another king. Everybody had a political reason for what they were doing except the people who were living it. And all they were doing was trying to do right. But everybody else put a political overtone on it and said, we're going to persecute you because we have said this is wrong even though it's morally correct. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I do know this. It's going to get much more uncomfortable for everybody. Guarantee it. I'm prophesying. Welcome to trouble. Persecution is our inheritance. Listen to me. If you aren't being persecuted, check your life. I'm not asking you to try to live real stupid so you can be persecuted. <laughs> Feel like you're doing something really right because somebody doesn't like what you're doing, which is wrong. Going into your office building, holding up a Bible saying, we're going to read the Bible today. Every one of us. And then you get fired. You say persecution. No, you were stupid. <laughs> you were stupid. That's, they didn't pay you to do that. You do that Bible stuff on your free time, not during, during company time. What's wrong with you? You need discipleship. Come to a small group. But, it, but persecution is our inheritance. Jesus said, if they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. If they did it to the master, they're going to do it to the students, to the pupils. There's no way around it if you're living right. No way around it. And we shouldn't shy away from it. Jesus said, you're blessed if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. And it's not just preaching the gospel, though the context is everything that comes from preaching the gospel under which things that you do must be done well. How you approach things, how you address things, what you say, what you do. All the persecuted for righteousness, doing right. Blessed are you. And he goes through and he says, if you are persecuted, and the word persecuted means pursued. You are chased. Somebody is trying to figure out how in the world to apprehend you so that they can stop your progress. That's what it means. So it doesn't necessarily mean you are physically harmed. It might mean that somebody in your employment who doesn't like that you are a Christian is doing their very best to try to figure out how they can get you fired by tagging something that you actually didn't do on you. I know some of you have, have seen people lie about your, your, your deeds and your employment. To, uh, to your supervisor to get you fired. That is persecution if you are having it happen for righteousness sake and that you've been doing right. Envy has filled the other person's soul. At that moment, please do not think you need to repay evil for evil. Mm -mm -mm. When you find out about it, bless them. I only got half amens on that. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Bless them. P Peter says this in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult. This is verse, verse 9. But intent, instead, return a blessing because you were called to inherit a blessing. Now, what Peter's trying to say is when you are treated poorly, don't respond in kind. Because when you do respond in kind, you're forgetting the fact that God did not respond in kind to you. The way you got your blessing was not because you earned it. You got it as an inheritance. The way you got saved was because God decided to do so, not because you were so good. Since you inherited a blessing, even though you didn't deserve it, you inherited a blessing when you should have gotten a, a judgment. When somebody treats you bad, do the same for them. Instead, bless. When somebody treats you bad, what can I pray for you about? How's your family? You have any struggles in your life? Now, you don't do it for this reason. But when you do that, when somebody is treating you bad, do you know what it does to their brain? It is. I mean, they, they might be looking at your stone face, but on the inside they're going, what are you doing? Why are you saying that? You ought to be slapping me in the face. What is wrong? I don't understand what's going on. And they go to bed thinking about you. They wake up thinking about you. And that's the presence of the Holy Spirit that is now able to convict them of their sin. 
Not just of the sin of doing you wrong, but overall their sin. When you display the character of Christ who was treated poorly and cried out not. Didn't say a word. Anybody could have had the right to cry out and say, get him, God. And he would not have been wrong to do so. Because he was all right. But he didn't just say, I'm going to live at a righteous level. He chose an optimal level. He said, okay, let, let, me, let me give you the three levels at which Christ had to go through in order to get to where he got. One is, God, get them. Get them. Because you know I'm right and they're wrong. So get them. There are a whole bunch of Psalms where he could quote and say, vanquish my enemies, please, because I've been right before you. He would have been right to do that. He bypassed that one. And then he had to go to the other one. Okay, I forgive them. We don't even hear him saying that. But obviously he did it. And so he went not only to the place at which he said no judgment, but to the place at which he said, I forgive them. And then he went above that. Daddy, let them go. Please let them go, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. Now, we Christians go to level two, and we think we have really done something well. Okay, I didn't ask for judgment, and I forgave them. Fine. But on the inside, there's something of, okay, I let them go, but Lord, <laughs> you want to get them, you can get them if you want to. Now, I'm just saying, it's, judgment is the Lord's, vengeance is almighty God's now. I'm through with it. It's in your hands. And we may not say that, but we evidence the fact that we are pretty happy with things that might happen untoward to them, that when they do, we go, mm, see, don't mess with me. <laughs> we didn't get them. Instead of when something happens untoward to them, us weeping. Weeping. We evidence the fact that we haven't gotten to level three by the fact that we don't mourn when people who have treated us poorly have bad things happen to them as a result. And hear me, I've lived there. I've had to learn these lessons. I've, I've preached the gospel long enough to be treated poorly. And I've seen people who have treated me poorly as a result of preaching the gospel be treated poorly by God. And I wept. I begged, Lord, please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Don't. I know me. I know how messed up I am. I know I should have deserved judgment. You said, blessed are the merciful. They'll receive mercy. That's what I've received. Please don't get them. And I see stuff happen, and I say, oh, okay, you're righteous, but my heart still hurts. When we are persecuted, that's how we ought to be trying to figure out how in the world we can return a blessing instead of a curse. And realize that we have an inheritance. We have the kingdom. Blessed are you who are persecuted for yours is the kingdom of heaven. We get the strength of all that God has. Listen, when an ambassador goes to a country and represents this country, he realizes he's not going by himself. When he goes, he's packing the entire U.S. Air Force, the Army, the Navy SEALs, the Marines. Everybody is behind whatever he says on behalf of this nation. That's why he goes to enemy in, or, or, or unfriendly territory, realizing I've got my entire kingdom behind me. And when we are not treated well, we have to realize that the, that the kingdom of heaven is ours. We are not alone. Our God is our protector. And protector does not mean that things won't happen bad to us. As I said, persecution is our inheritance. All of the early apostles, save one, died a martyr's death. That's no fun. That's painful. But they were preserved through death and got eternal life. Our lives have already been given up for the glory of God. 
Our lives should not be the most important thing about which we are concerned. It should be the other people's lives. And so if we're most concerned about our own when it comes to whether we should say something or not, whether we should do something or not, we have not embraced the cross as we should have. Our lives are not that important, as evidenced by the fact that Paul just did not care about his own well-being. Every time they warned him about going to a spot where he was going to be persecuted and beaten and flogged and, and, and poorly treated, he said, I know. And he went anyway. Why? Because he got a prophetic word when he first got born again, which kind of should be a word for all of us. Ananias was told by God, who was Paul's disciple, Ananias, in Acts chapter 9, he said, I want you to go to this street called Straight and minister to this dude named Saul, who would later be Paul. And Ananias argued with God and said, um, do you know who he is? He's the guy that kills people like me. I don't think that's really a good idea. Just FYI, God. He said, I've already shown him your face. What? Uh, <laughs> what did you do that for? I mean, he's coming to the city to kill folks and you showed him my face. Oh, oh, come on, God. That's not even fair. Yeah, go. Minister to him. He said, I want you to tell him this. Tell him all the things he must suffer for my name's sake. That was his prophetic word. That's the thing that God spoke to him. So Paul said, eh, my life is not mine anyway. Persecution is our portion. But the kingdom is our inheritance as well. And then you get people who treat you continually and creatively maleficently. So you get the sense verse 10 is about one encounter, but verse 11 is about an extended period whereby a culture is created around persecution of you or the church. He said, when they say all kinds of evil about you, insults, and they lie about you, and they pursue you, persecute you, do this, consider yourself blessed because yours is the kingdom and you need to rejoice and be glad because you get to identify with those who have gone before you that are prophets. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad about your persecution. <laughs> you talk about counterintuitive. Wow. But remember, this Jesus is the one who entered into a world that did not like him. I told you I'd weave in a Christmas message here. It's hard to be happy, you know, when you're talking about persecution. Christmas is supposed to be happy. But remember, we're happy about our salvation. But Jesus came into a world where, where as a baby, Herod tried to kill him. All he knew was being pursued, persecuted. And yet he could not let that damper his soul. He still rejoiced in his purpose. And he knew that he came for the purpose of being persecuted and dying on our behalf. And he was still happy. He still found joy in his life. Why? Because he realized, I'm in the kingdom. I'm a part of a much bigger thing than whatever they can throw. And my, my life for their benefit is actually going to see them become more like me. So it's worth it. Rejoice and be glad. Because you are, you are able to identify with those who suffered before you, the prophets of old. This is what it takes for the world to get right. Our lives laid down for it. Sacrifice for other people's benefits. Jesus raised the bar so high, he said, you've heard it said, it's okay. It's a good thing. Everybody loves those who love them. I tell you, love your enemies because you're going to create a lot of them. Just about the whole world is going to hate you. Love your enemies. We are called for this purpose and at some point, it's going to cost much more than any of us thought we were going to have to pay. America and the culture that is created of comfort is, is no friend to the fullness of the gospel. It doesn't help us understand the degree to which we must sacrifice in order to see our world won. And although none of us can be Jesus and never should pretend to be, we are called to be like him and laid on our lives for this world. Paul, martyr's death. Peter, martyr's death. James, martyr's death. These men realized he died for me. The least I can do is give my life for him. 
the disciples as I close being persecuted in Acts chapter 5. They were told to not preach in this name anymore as a result of a man who was lame for some 30 plus years being healed at the gate beautiful when Peter went through to pray. And the man not only who was lame got to walk, but he, he actually jumped and danced, it said, in the temple. And nobody could refute the fact that this was the same guy who was lame for over three decades. The religious leaders were mad at Peter. You heal the guy that's no longer on welfare. We no longer have to pay his, his bills. And you're mad? They're mad. They're mad. They say, don't preach in his name anymore. In chapter 4, in chapter 4, Peter says, you tell us, is it better to obey God or men? They went back out and started preaching. It says with more boldness. They brought him back in and they said, we told you not to preach in this name. They said, so? And they got beaten. Beaten. And, and we're talking about with rods. The kind of rods that look like broom handles. Just over and over and over and over and over. And it says that they went out from their presence rejoicing. It says they were rejoicing because they were considered worthy to suffer for his namesake. I don't know what it's going to look like in the days to come. But I'm just preparing you for your inheritance. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace. Empower us as a people to live as we should. Is there anybody this morning that has yet to give their heart to Christ? Maybe you've made a decision in the past, but your life doesn't look anything like what a believer's ought to be. And you want to make a change today. If you fit in either of those categories, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Today is a great day to get right with God. Anybody at all? See that hand, bless you. Once it's up, you can put it down. Anybody else in the room? All right, you who raised your hands and you who are online who really want to understand what it means to serve God well and to dedicate your life to his purposes, pray with me. Say, Father in heaven, forgive me. I am sorry for the way I've lived. I choose to turn away from everything I know to be sin and to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for giving me the privilege of calling Jesus the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.